Assalamu alaikum, namaste, satsakal, shalom and good day. You are listening to Awaz Community Radio. And today we have two very lovely guests who are going to be talking about politics. Now, please do not switch off the radio. It's very important that we talk about these topics. Now, I'm sure there are people out there probably thinking they've probably had enough after the referendum. But you know what? It'd be really good to hear local politicians talking to you directly about how they feel, okay? No waffle, just honest chat about what's been happening since we've had the referendum. Now, if you would like to get in touch with us, give us a call on 0161 839 9817. You can email us awazcommunityradio at gmail.com. We're on Facebook, just type in Awaz Community Radio or tweet us at awazradio122. Your host for today is Syrah, and my guests today are Afzal Khan and Heather Fletcher. Welcome to the radio. Well, uh, shall I start by saying Assalamu alaikum, Namaste, Sasrikar, Shalom. I hope you're having a good day. Thank you very much. Thank and you, Afzal. From me, good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Okay, so would you like to introduce yourselves a little bit to our listeners before we launch into the big debate? Uh, well, I'm Afzal Khan, and uh, I was a long-time councillor for this area. Uh, and then 2014, I became an MEP for the Northwest uh, at the European Parliament. I am a vice uh, president of uh, Security and Defence Committee. Uh, I'm also involved with uh, Bosnia. Uh, I also do interfaith work uh, as representative also of the president uh, for the Muslim communities. So it's uh, quite exciting. Great, thank you. And Heather? Yes, I'm Councillor Heather Fletcher and I've only recently become elected a councillor and it's for Swinton South in Salford. And um, I was originally a solicitor on Cheatham Hill and my main rival was a solicitor across the road who was uh, Afsal Khan. So I followed him into, well, he followed me into law and then I followed him into politics. And I'm also in interfaith work. I'm actually the co-chair of the Muslim Jewish Forum of Greater Manchester. And I've been involved with the Muslim Jewish Forum for 11 years now, first as secretary and then as co-chair. So my main interests are politics and interfaith. I'm really glad that you just said to our listeners that you're interested in politics and interfaith because that is exactly what we're going to be talking about today on the radio. Now, the EU referendum, we know the results. The Brexiteers, the Bre Brexit is going to happen. Mm. Uh, that is what the public have voted for. 52% in favour and 48% were not in favour. Now, Afsal, can I ask you, how did you feel when you heard the result? I think I was uh, shocked a little bit, uh, although throughout the campaign I felt uh, there's going to be a close one. But deep down I felt that actually, despite being close one, but it will be the Remain who will win. Uh, and the reason for me thinking that, I thought, was all the information I have. And uh, logically looking at it, it makes so much uh, sense. It's such a strong case to Remain that despite some of the negativities, some of the difficulties, including the immigration, on balance, people would realize that actually it's better for us to stay. But I was proven wrong. <laughs> and you, Heather, how did you feel? I was very shocked. I, I must admit, I was convinced Remain would win, win all the time because I thought at the end of the day, people don't like change and they're frightened of the, a leap into the unknown and they'll probably vote to remain. The only time I felt, oh gosh, we could lose, was on the day of the referendum itself when I spent about four hours outside Swinton Shopping Centre and I got about, out of every ten, something like uh, six or seven saying they wanted to leave. And their main reason was, oh, we liked uh, this country 40 years ago and uh, well, let's go back to how we were. Um, that was the first inkling I had that we could leave. Right. So do you believe that the people who voted leave were voting for the past? Is that what you're trying to say, do you think? I think there's a, re a real mixture. The people that were voting for the past were the over 65s, of which there is quite a lot in my ward in Swinton. Um, that was their reason they wanted to go back to the past. But other people, I think there was so much misinformation and, um, and also younger people maybe believed the uh, things that were put out by Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage. 
I actually think uh, that the Remain campaign was not strong enough and I think neither Cameron nor Corbyn got out the message clearly enough. And one of the main things was as to how much money we would lose. I mean, Greater Manchester alone stands to lose 350 million leaving the EU. And I just don't think our arguments were put forward as clearly or as forcefully as the out campaign. How did you feel about the Remain campaign, Mr Khan? No, I don't actually feel quite like that. Um, I think uh, Remain uh, campaign was... Uh, reasonably okay actually in fact i thought remain campaign was actually better than the leave campaign the reason uh, i believe we got the referendum result is nothing to do with the campaign itself i think uh, i i think it's to do with long term uh, drip drip damage that already had been caused so when you had the remain campaign people giving virtually close to what the facts are yeah uh, people were actually not listening uh, and that's to do with historical context and I think the second reason I think uh, what's happened is it's not necessarily that people want to be back to what it was 40-50 years ago I think what's happening is that there is a change uh, which is happening the change is happening actually globally it's not just happening in Britain and the change is also happening faster and faster. And that change is creating uncertainty, in particularly in the elder generation, who are finding it difficult to cope with that change. And that, I think, is where they're looking for the stability. So I, 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 this is how I look at it. And of course, immigration is also one of the aspects uh, which has been uh, dominant in the whole debate. And if you look at the in and out campaign, uh, what had happened was the Remain campaign predominantly focused on the economic benefits and the leave uh, in different ways pushed this immigration agenda forward. And you can remember those uh, advertisement with the Turkish red passport and 80 odd millions are coming in. and. Uh, we can't control our borders, we want to get our border packs. All those languages at the heart of it was about immigration. Uh, and, and I think uh, if you add to that mixture this uh, last sort of eight years of austerity, which has meant that many of the public services have taken a big hit. And me and uh, many people who use those public services a uh, large section of that are blaming because of the immigration. I think the truth is immigration may be contributing in some parts, but overall it's actually these huge cuts which mm. have made that impact. So it's this combination which has delivered us the referendum result. So you believe that the perception of immigration was incorrect, and I guess any discussion <coughs> about the perception of immigration must involve the role of the media. How do you th Absolutely. What kind of role do you think the media played? Well, uh, I am certainly not a Daily Mail reader, but my dad reads it avidly. And when I went round to his uh, flat and now where he lives in the care home, I have a look at his Daily Mail and it is full of anti-immigration rhetoric. And you know, people who are intelligent like my dad would, would see through it. But a lot of people... Uh, really, really believe what they read in the Daily Mail, and it's and the Express, I think, is equally bad. And they're, as Afsal says, they drip fed this for years, mm -hmm. and they begin to believe, oh, the immigrants are coming, they're undercutting um, our wages, are taking our jobs. But at the end of the day, actually, immigration is vastly beneficial, and it is as Afsal used to say in all his EU talks the immigrants that come into this country from the eu are young they work hard and they pay into our system they pay taxes and the people that leave our country say to go and live in spain are usually retired and they could have been a drain on the resources so immigration has a very positive effect but you wouldn't read that in the daily mail or daily express to go back to one of Afsal's points about the cuts in public services and the effects then being blamed on immigration, there was the infamous red bus, which said mm. um, 
said slash implied as uh, the radio station must be very careful as to yes. how we state this. Two hundred twenty um, million. The um, giving, putting money back into the NHS, so money that was going into the EU would be uh, diverted back into the NHS. Mm. Um, that has since proven to be incorrect. Uh, that was something that was taken back very quickly. That statement, that entire bus was taken back. Yes. How do you feel about the impact that one red bus made? I think it was a, a big Wolper lie, lie, isn't it? <laughs> Which was a pedal, and they peddled it throughout the campaign. And it's the next day after the res- uh, referendum result that they're saying, oh, 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 oh <laughs> hold on, <laughs> we're not owning this. Uh, and this has been the tragedy, I think, of this whole campaign. Uh, that soon as the referendum result has come out, what you've seen is nothing much has been done on the actual result. We still have not done anything on it. But what has had is, uh, we've seen is an explosion, uh, explosion at a political uh, level. And the leadership in the government resigned they went into meltdown, they went into a new election, new leadership. Uh, I'm so pleased that actually they've been able to sort it out quickly. Mm. Uh, and now that we do have a government which is trying to work out what exactly can they do. Yeah. Then you had the Her Majesty's opposition, which is the Labour Party. Uh, sadly, they decided this was the time to have a go at the leadership, which as I thought was uh, crazy, absolutely crazy. When, kin- when the country needed stability, uh, sadly, you know, they decided to do this. I think it was appalling, uh, personally. As a Labour Party person, I'm saying this, you know, I am a Labour Party member. I, I think that's was awful what they did. Uh, and then you had some of these main players uh, who've been campaigning against uh, leaving Britain, basically coming out. All of them were all over the show. Uh, Nigel Farage himself decided, thank you very much, I've achieved. You know, when the hard work started, he's the first one to run, yeah? Mm-hmm. Uh, similarly, with some of the main players in the Conservative Party were doing the same thing. Uh, and the truth is, you know, they led people onto this path. People made that decision, uh, and then there's no one there to deliver it. Uh, and the same time uh, we're paying the price in a sense by creating this uncertainty we've seen the hit on the pound we've seen uh, confidence uh, sort of eroding there's a, we've never seen anything like this before you know there's a research after research uh, which is coming out as well and the facts coming out as well and on top of that all the lies that they've been peddling you know so I feel very uncomfortable uh, seriously uh, with where we are as a country um, I remember doing a debate on BBC a couple of weeks after uh, the referendum result. And it was a one-hour debate, uh, and you had a person there who was for the Leave campaign. And the presenter was very good. The presenter nailed him and said, look, you don't have a plan, you know, for this. Uh, He really couldn't answer it because they didn't have a plan. But what was shocking for me was, after one hour's debate, I then concluded that actually not only they don't have a plan, they don't even understand the scale of the job ahead, you know, what needs to be done in order for us to pull us apart, you know, from the relationship that we have been part of for over sort of 40 years. Uh, They actually don't even fully comprehend the task ahead. And I thought, thought that was appalling uh, for just some of the senior people being engaged. And they didn't even see it through the full complexity of the impact this would have and uh, what needs to be done. Uh, so um, fingers are crossed. Uh, I now the decision is there. My position ultimately is, you know, I want to see a deal now which is good for Britain because Britain is my country. Britain is a country for my children, my future generations. Uh, so, whatever the referendum result, we now really need to all pull together and really work at this deal. And, 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 and my deep fear is that whatever we do now, the deal we may end up with actually will be worse than what we had. Mm-hmm. And therefore, then the question is, 
do we still go ahead or what do we do when we now realize because the whole campaign they never came up with any answers you know what is the alternative they always use this uh, we want uh, our control back you know what does that mean you know we always had a border control w what are you talking about yeah we want the sovereignty back whoa, whoa, whoa. when did we lose the sovereignty what's the problem you know if you agree to do something it doesn't mean you're losing sovereignty so they use all these very motive terms uh, but the reality is then the other way around now so is it then uh, would be right for the government to really look at uh, this alternative uh, and the look at what we have now and maybe then ask the question again and say hold on you know we've made this decision we've done our best some of these people who are for leaving are now heading for this deal uh, once they've negotiated this deal they come back we look at it then if this is worse then what we have does it make sense for us to carry on and of course because we have a referendum uh, where there's a decision made then what's the alternative well the alternative may well be put the two deals to the people again so the people are clear you know the two different roads which are there for us what are the plus and minuses with that clarity uh, that you have decision because throughout my campaign I, I, I had this concern and I used to say this that you know this referendum decision must not be made on misinformation it should be made on correct information and I feel actually it was made on misinformation and that's where I am on it how do you feel Heather do you, I just wondered if Afsa really thinks two years down the line I mean I, I would quite like it but would the whole country really like to go through another referendum and also the costliness of it Yes, um, look, it's a question. Uh, oh, the point I'm trying to make is, if you re made a decision, and then once you made the decision down the road, you realize that you made a wrong decision, mm -hmm. is it sensible that you carry on with it? That's the question I'm asking. You know, in the life, mm -hmm. we make decisions all the time. Yeah. Isn't it common sense that once you realize that you made a wrong decision, you basically pull back and say, hold on, I don't need to carry through this. Yes. And that's where I am. And now, I'm not saying uh, that, look, uh, it should be automatic. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is I respect the refer referendum decision, despite the fact that I disagree with it, you know. But this is democracy, mm -hmm. you know. We yes. can have our opinion. End of the day, you have to then follow what the decision is. Now, if this is the decision, now we are clear, and that's becoming abundantly clear if the parliament looks at it, I mean, they are the representatives. And they say, say that, hold on, <laughs> this is bad, <laughs> yeah? Yes. This is not a good uh, deal which we really didn't know about. Now we know. I just can't see where the logic is to carrying on with that bad decision. That's my argument. So I'm saying then go back to the people and say, okay, mm -hmm. you made that decision, you ordered us to do this, we've gone, those people who wanted to leave, they negotiated all this, mm -hmm. and this is what they've got back for us. And, and it's worse. Yeah. It's worse than what we have. <laughs> If so you think it's worse than we have, thank you very much. Make a decision. Now, so it's up to them then. Yeah, who would call another referendum? Would it be? The government, of course. Theresa May, yeah. Of course, it's the government who yes. calls the referendum. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting how, um, I mean, the last five weeks in British politics have been, um, I think they've boggled everyone's minds. Everyone is stunned by I've it, never the seen anything like it, yeah. seriously. I've never seen anything like it, what's and happened in the British politics. We now have a new Prime Minister, our second female Prime Minister, yes. and she has cl made it clear that Article 50 will not be triggered by herself in 2016 at least, mm. so which has bought time for the government. Perhaps well, that time explains for the that they had no plan. <laughs> yes. That's what the issue is. Nobody actually had a plan. Either the government, which should have a responsibility actually, to look at both alternatives, because if you're going for a question, answer can go either way. So do you think that I am... Um, I think the Tory government failed on that, yeah. Do, do you think Theresa May will trigger Article 50? David Cameron was very keen not to be the one who does yes. it because whoever does it will go down in history, will be remembered for this moment. She'll get somebody else to trigger <coughs> it for her. Probably this, is it David Davis? It's yeah, but look, at the end of the day, it's the government. Uh, yes. it's, the, it's, it's not an individual. Uh, it is very and interesting The government how is a Tory government and they then have to now 
implement. It's their decision to have the referendum. There's no need for a referendum. Mm. They, they said that they'll do this. There now they have to carry it through. There are many yeah. people saying that um, they, we didn't want the referendum. I'm, I'm not, I can't quote a statistic there. There are many people saying that we would pr- have preferred the people we have elected to make the decision. This referendum uh, was not necessary. I, I, have, yes. I have met people actually who said it to my face when I asked them on this question, you know, how do you feel, etc. And their answer was, we pay you to make this decision. Why are you asking mm. us? Yeah. Uh, this is a parliamentary democracy. You know, we elect our government and our government makes that decision. Yeah. So, yeah, there is an argument. But the truth is, it doesn't matter about that argument. We have asked that question by this government, asked the question. People have given a decision. Now they have to, I think, go ahead and they have to enforce or invoke the Article 50. They have to negotiate and they have to get, try to get the best deal they can. And once they've got a deal, I'm saying, hold on, po- take a pause there. Once we've got the deal, now look at the deal and say, right, this is the best deal we've been able to negotiate. And this is the deal which we already have. Which is it better for Britain? And if the conclusion of the parliament, which is who are our representative, is that this decision is worse, then I think parliament shouldn't just make a decision. Because they can if they want. Mm. yeah, And say, no, no, we'll stick with what we got. They can. But I think it's fair then, because of, because of the referendum, that then they ask for another referendum. Look, uh, I hear what Heather said, the cost. On a lot, big scheme of things, cost isn't that much, especially if the issue is very strategic uh, in a geopolitical point of view, an economic point of view, uh, which has a huge consequences, then cost is not that important. Uh, there, the right decision is important. There is a lot of debate as to whether, although of course we can't doubt the fact that Brexit has been voted for, mm. there's, there is a lot of doubt being expressed in the media if it will ever actually happen. This could drag out for many years. There, I'm aware of um, <coughs> lawsuits. Uh, there's yes, some kind of legal yes, challenge being made. Is, the is. referendum is not legally binding. We have to make that clear. That's so just what I was going to say. Uh, there's two other points I wanted to make. Well, firstly, I think David Cameron never thought in a million years he'd lose the referendum. I don't think he thought he was even taking a chance. That's why <coughs> he, you know, he thought, obviously, to satisfy his backbenchers, and he thought, well, I'm not going to lose. I think he was probably more shocked than anybody, actually. <coughs> and the other point was I have read somewhere that the, um, the uh, result of the referendum is not legally binding and that Parliament could, in fact, set it aside. It's uh, true. Uh, yeah. The referendum is advisory. But I would be very uncomfortable, uh, even for someone who is for remaining, uh, for uh, us to just put this result to one side. I think uh, once you've gone to the people at a scale of referendum point of view and a decision has been made, then you've got to be very careful uh, because the question then is, well, why did you do it? Yes. You know? uh, and second is morally, you know, if the people have given a will, you know, this is our decision, then you owe it to them. Try, at least try to implement it. Mm-hmm. And that's my argument, that try to implement it now. Do the best you can. Get, try to get the best deal you can. But then look at it. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing I'm saying. Yes. That then look at it. And then actually it will be very clear for all of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, our new prime minister is on the Remain side, um, yes. although... <coughs> has, it has been reported. She but was she a said very ex- quiet uh, remainer. Um, Brexit means Brexit. Yes. Know, so she and was respecting that decision. She's put mm-hmm. in charge of major offices such as the Foreign, Office, Foreign Secretary is now Boris Johnson mm-hmm. and we have David Davis who Who's will be negotiating, negotiating it. Yeah. They are both well known for yeah. being pro-Brexit. All the three main Brexit. players uh, in this context who would be dealing with this all are British uh, Brit exit. Uh, they want to leave. I think it's a good thing, uh, personally. Was that clever negotiating by, by Theresa May, strategic planning? I, I think it was I clever. So, Look, yes. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, what you got is uh, people sh- must respect uh, the government's decision in this sense that they gave a decision, people gave the decision, and then people must feel that they were listened to and who can be better than the main players who had been arguing for leaving they themselves heading the whole negotiations and then coming back with a deal because they were the one who will most likely to get the best deal because they believe in being out. Mm. Uh, and this, I think, in the long term is better as well.
for the confidence uh, point of view. So people have confidence that a genuine attempt was made and the deal that we got was the best deal we could have got in the circumstances. Yeah? Uh, and, and that allows us to ask the next question again. And that's why I think it's absolutely right move. And after all, they asked for this, so why they may as well clean this mess. Yeah, that's, uh, we have a, a Tory friend, and he says, I said, how come she's put Boris Johnson and David Davis and Liam Fox? And he says to me, he says, well, she's saying to them, uh, you've got us in this mess, you get us out of it. Fair yeah, enough. That's fair that, enough. Yeah, it probably is uh, yeah, yeah. true. So I, I thought it was the right move. Yes. Uh, politically clever move. Uh, and in a way, uh, we should, they will do their bit, and we should do our bit as well, try to get a good deal. Mm. So while the politicians are going to be hopefully busy thrashing out the best deal possible, yes. as we have to accept that Brexit is supposed to happen, how do you feel about what's happened since the referendum result? What are you seeing in the communities around you? What are the consequences, the fallout? Well, I've certainly read that uh, since Brexit, I think race hate crimes have gone up something like 300 percent and i've read awful things about uh, graffiti on polish shops go home and um, a U ukrainian person and i think it was an, an american on the train on the tram and it, it's sort of like uh, the fact we've got out of the eu it's in a way, to some people, it legitimises uh, them being able to say to our uh, Polish friends and immigrants, go home now. And I think that's the worst possible um, result of, the, of Brexit, or certainly one of the worst possible results. And it's made people very um, uncaring and, and nasty. I, I, I think uh, this has been uh, appalling, actually. Uh, a Britain which had a great reputation uh, worldwide uh, of a country which celebrates uh, richness and diversity, which feels that the diversity itself is a strength actually, not a weakness, and the differences makes us stronger. Uh, and in reality it does. Yeah? The world we are in actually, uh, the more diverse you are, the better you are. It's a proven fact that. Uh, but what's happened is uh, I blame the leadership uh, because I don't mean in narrow sense of uh, leadership of the government. I mean the political leadership across the board. Uh, the way some of them behaved was appalling. Uh, they, in a way, le legitimize this behavior. And when they themselves did it, many other people f felt it's acceptable that you can do it. So we're now reaping the consequences of those uh, languages of this leadership with irresponsibility that they've shown. Um, and quite interestingly, that uh, areas, there's a correlation uh, between areas where they wanted to leave and the rise of the hate crime. The more stronger they were for the leave, more the hate crime. So clearly there's a connection uh, with the sort of sentiments which was being used, which motivated. Uh, somebody said this, which I found it very interesting, and they said that uh, not all people who want to leave are racist, but all the racists are for the leave. Mm. So I think that element uh, which all societies have, feels empowered, uh, feels uh, legitimacy in able to express these. And uh, sadly, it's not just been uh, Eastern Europeans who have uh, felt the brunt. It has been all different uh, minority communities who have felt. People have openly saying, well, mm. why are you not packed up yet? Mm. You know, uh, people are still saying, well, you are next. Uh, things like that, which is awful, awful. There's so many examples of terrible events. Um, but I think uh, what we need to do is show leadership. Uh, in that leadership, I think uh, the wider leaders come in, and people like Heather and others who do a lot of interfaith work, I think have also have a lot of important uh, roles to do. Um, 
if you st take a step back, uh, while this is a symptom and the problem that we're trying to handle, uh, deeper down, I think what's happening is uh, the concern people have, the uncertainty people have, which I expressed earlier on, mm, at the heart of it is this, that we are in a world where we can communicate so easily, globally. And we're also in a time where globally people are moving around. Uh, at the moment, the position is one billion people are flying every year. A billion mm -hmm. is a huge number. Yeah. So that means actually more and more are moving around, more of, more of us are coming across different things. So that means really we just can't carry on living in the 19th, 20th century idea. Uh, we need to be able to now absorb these ideas better and therefore we need to be doing things which means that we all take a step towards one another. We all feel a responsibility towards one another. We all feel a responsibility of learning about the others so that this fear element can be handled. The best way of handling a fear is being awareness. Uh, and, and this is where this work becomes so important now. And we all have to actually do that. And you've been doing a lot of interfaith work yourself too, Heather. Yes. Well, our Muslim Jewish Forum of Greater Manchester was actually co-founded 11 years ago by Afzal and also uh, the late Henry Gutterman. And I fell into it totally by chance. A uh, fellow I was going around with at the time, we used to go to the cinema every week. And it came to August 2004. And I said, there's absolutely nothing on at the cinema. And I said, oh, there's an interesting meeting, this first meeting of Muslims and Jews in the town hall. Um, will you go to that with me? And he said, well, oh, all right, I suppose we want to go out and there's nothing on at the cinema. So, yeah, we'll go along. He says, uh, do you know anybody? I said, uh, no. I said, this is Henry Gutterman. And he says, oh, um, I know him. He's a really big Jewish community activist. He wears a bow tie. And uh, he says, who's this Afzal Khan? Do you know him? I said, well, actually, I've never met him, but he used to work across the road from me, and uh, we were rivals for divorce, uh, divorces. And I said, actually, I'd like to see what he's like in real life. <laughs> so he said, oh, le OK, let's go along. You know, it'll be fun. It'll be something different. And that was the funny side of it. But on the serious side, we we've, were very overcome by the meeting and thought how nice it is to see that there are people willing to mix with each other from our communities. And I must admit, the only um, Muslim friend I'd had in sort of 40 years at this point was um, a workmate. And, uh, and everybody in the room was really friendly. And then they said, I think we're going to set up a Muslim Jewish forum and the next committee meeting's in November. So I said to him, should we go along? And he says, oh, all right, well, we'll, we will go along to the next one. And then the next one, they said, who wants to be on the committee? And he says, well, I don't, I don't like committees. And I said, oh, I think I'll be on a committee. And I'd never been on a committee in my life to that date. And then the next thing I know, um, AFSA becomes Lord Mayor in May 2005. And Henry Gutterman and Mohammed Amin, who was also a founder member, uh, come up to me and they say, would you like to be the secretary of the Muslim Jewish Forum? Uh, because Afsal can't do it, he's Lord Mayor. And I said, yeah. I said, yes, I'll do it. I said, I I'll only do it for a year. And then when Afsal finishes being Lord Mayor, you know, he'll come back and do it. Anyway, I did this for a year. And, uh, and they said to me, oh, no, Afsal's too busy. To you'll have to continue. So I continued as a secretary for nine years. And... Um, in that time, I organised, I think it was, we had, in nine years, we had something like 90 events. And I was responsible for organising about 60 of them, the main organisers uh, of it. And I got really into it and met a lot of people I, I certainly wouldn't have met otherwise. And the more and more you mix with people who are different to yourself, you the more you realise, actually, they're not that different. We've got so much in common. And... Now, you don't think of sort of like uh, Tahara Amin as being the Muslim lady. You think of Tahara Amin as being your friend who makes, who's a good cook and, 
you know, is a good listener. You, you just, you realise that you have got so much in common. Anyway, a year and a half ago, I thought, well, I've been a secretary for nine years. I think I'll have a go at being the co-chair. And I became the co-chair. And uh, we did celebrate our 10th anniversary uh, uh, last year. And we had the chief rabbi, who is a very, very, very busy man. And yet he thought it was worthwhile enough to come up from London to be the guest, uh, as did, as did uh, Sheikh Mogra. And we got about 100 people at the dinner. And um, also, very important, we've won a couple of awards. We won uh, the British Muslim Award in 2014. And about two months ago, we won a Fusion Award. So whereas we're not in it for awards, it is nice that the wider Fusion. community recognise that we're doing good work in bringing communities together. But my main point is before the Muslim Jewish Forum, I wouldn't say Muslims and Jews didn't get on, it's just they had no interaction. Uh, whereas since the Muslim Jewish Forum, so many of us have become really good friends and it becomes normal now to have a Muslim friend as a, a Jewish friend. And in fact, in August, I'm invited to two weddings. One of them is my a Muslim friend's daughter and the other one is a Jewish friend's son. So, and to me, that's enriched my life so much because I think if we all live in our own little bubble and only mix with Jewish people, or uh, in my case, I think it would be a very, very boring. In fact, when I was as young as 11, uh, I said to my parents, I don't want to continue at the Jewish school. And they looked and they said, why not? I said, because I want to mix with everybody. And from that day onwards, that's always been my attitude, that we live in a country that, as Afsal says, it accepts all people from all over the world, and therefore we can't stay in our own little bubble. We have to mix with everybody, learn from each other. And I do believe that it's ignorance that causes intolerance, but it's getting to know each other and mixing together, which hopefully promotes harmony and community cohesion. And it feels like that this message is as timely as ever, given the backdrop of the post-referendum, mm. yes. uh, the uh, recent attacks in France, in Germany, yeah. um, around the world, mm. and uh, heightened security alerts and so on uh, in many European countries. It feels like that this message of tolerance and respect is mm. so much more important. I mean, like I in the introduction that uh, I'm a vice yeah. chair of security and defence, uh, so I deal with this issue day in and day out. Uh, and I think uh, there are elements uh, in all groups uh, who basically the agenda is common. And that is a agenda of division. And in response to that, our responsibility is actually to have a very clear agenda of the opposite, not the division, but actually the unity of working together, of sharing things, collaborating partnership, all those things which are very positive throughout the history. Uh, and I think in this day and age, it's even more important because we are more and more interconnected, interdependent on one another. Uh, that is where we are. And this idea is going to get more, not less. And therefore, the sooner all of us start uh, playing on this, uh, the better the world we're going to have. That's very true. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really glad that you're here promoting the good work that the Muslim Jewish Forum does yeah. because it, that kind of good news does not get enough publicity. It certainly doesn't. <coughs> it, it, uh, and we've, we've had such a variety of events to suit everybody's uh, interests. I mean, we had this picnic on Sunday where people just they come, they eat and they chat. And our next event is a much more serious one. Every year we have a lawyer's event I think it started because the two of us obviously used to be lawyers. And the lawyers events in September is a very serious one. The subject is for the panel. Can the government counter extremism without taking away people's Liberty. Li legal freedoms? Mm. Mm. And we've had a concert. We've had actually a couple of concerts. We've had uh, um, business meetings. We've, we've something to suit everybody and we do get I think we've got something like 400 on our mailing list but we see different people apart from obviously the core group of us all the time because like we had new people at the picnic 
and they said, what's the next event? So lawyers, oh, no, 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 I'm not interested in that. When's the next party? <laughs> so, uh, but as what, what you said about uh, getting in the papers, yes, uh, the evening you certainly gave coverage to our 10th anniversary dinner. Some of the smaller papers give us a little bit of coverage, but normally it's a sentence or two. I have got a, a friend who's more religious Jewish, and he gets the religious Jewish paper, and he says they actually cover us more than the mainstream Jewish paper, but they won't put any photographs in, because I'm usually in the photographs, and they won't have a photograph of a woman. So if it was just a photo of Afsal and Amin and Johnny and then it, the, they might print it, but they wouldn't print it if I'm in the photograph. But he says I'm mentioned quite a lot in this, this uh, Jewish paper, and that they, they, do, they were the first paper to actually announce that the forum had won this award. Yeah, great. Wow. Yeah. But don't worry, there is a paper who doesn't print if I'm in it. <laughs> who doesn't print? If I'm in it. <laughs> oh, that one. Oh, yes. <laughs> so yes. don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I, 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 I think the point Heather made ultimately mm. is about uh, reaching out. Um, and as a Muslim uh, who understood uh, their difficulties, their issues, uh, particularly Israel and Palestine, which really has soured this relationship in the history, you know, we've never been like this, uh, the truth is. We've always had a very good relationship this political issue which has sort of come and has really damaged this relationship. But it's only by reaching out you can then understand actually how much we have in common. Uh, it's only by working on this relationship of the Greater Manchester Muslim Jewish Forum that actually I've now concluded of all the different faiths that there are in the world the two which are the most closest are actually Muslim Jewish. So, but if you have never reached out, you will never know. You'll just be polarized mm -hmm. with this dispute which is in Israel and Palestine and somehow think this is the totality of Christianity, uh, Islam and Judaism. <laughs> it isn't. Yeah, it's just one area. There's a whole huge area where we actually agree. And being part of this uh, Greater Manchester Muslim Jewish Forum, we've been able to tackle many of the common challenges, issues, problems that we have, which are same. Uh, so that gives us strength, actually. So therefore, we should balance this uh, idea out uh, and don't just run away with just differences. Please look at these huge areas which we have actually commonality. And that commonality is where we should be strengthening more we and have, more. We have done some good work together. When um, Nick Griffin was standing for the BMP, obviously Muslims and Jews um, stood together to try and make sure that he wasn't elected. Unfortunately, he was, but we did stand together in that. And then uh, if the EDL come to town, we stand together. Mm. And the, the other... Um, thing was there was a um, halal and kosher yeah. was another one circumcision is yes. another one the death body uh, body the burial all those rules are similar mm. ones these are all our needs as humans you know but we Same. shared those things but the petition uh, there was a petition started by Amin it was to uh, against um, the veterinary yes. uh, petition the vet the vets wanted to said that it was inhumane to kill animals for halal and kosher mm. meat. And Amin started off this petition, and in a nine days he got 140,000 people, sure. mainly Muslims and Jews. So it was debated in Parliament. Yeah. So there's a lot of this huge area, you know. Equally with this whole area, we took it internationally. I was involved with there. Even now, in the European Parliament, uh, I'm involved from day one, working on anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. You know, these are the areas, and I also feel look here's another area where we actually we need to work together. Um, the causes may be slightly different, but the impact is exactly the same, you know. Uh, so I think there is so much, and that's the sort of plea both of us are really putting out uh, to your listeners that actually they should uh, take a step forward and try ex experiment different things. You will never know what you're missing if you don't try mm. it. Yeah. And if you like it, carry on. Yeah. And if you don't like it, well, try something else. <laughs> so we've got something to suit everybody. We've, you know, we've hopefully, as well as the serious event in September, at the end of October, we hope to have another 
party, this time in Salford in the Civic Centre, which is actually in the centre of, of my ward in Swinton. And um, we often have a, a festive party. And next year we're having a day trip to Bradford. Uh, because in Bradford, the uh, Muslim community actually helped to save the Jewish synagogue. Amazing story. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the first time I'm hearing about it. Is it? Yes. And, it's, and it's not right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In Bradford, uh, uh, the mosques and all of them came together to save a synagogue, which was going to be closed, and they put the money together to save it, and they did. This is the point I'm making. There are so many great examples, mm. you know, which are available. Uh, one of the other ones recently we both have been involved with is Bosnia, you know, the oh, whole yes. genocide of what happened there. Um, there's an amazing story there that... Uh, and during the Second World War, the Jewish Holocaust, which went on, many Bosnians were involved, and some Muslims in France, others, who were actually giving uh, Jewish people a Muslim identity to save them. Yeah? Uh, and, and then they, when the Bosnian issue happened, then there are many Jewish who saved the Bosnians. So it's a, such a lovely story, you know, how doing a good favor at one place has turned around, came back when they needed it. They then came and gave them that yeah. favor. Which, uh, this is what it's all about, really. And the press like you said. Yeah, like prefer to concentrate on negative stories. Just one thing about the Israel-Palestine issue. One thing that the four um, well, co-chairs that have been, there was um, Afsal and Johnny Weinberg, Mohammed Amin and myself, we've all agreed that we don't discuss Israel and Palestine because at the end of the day we live here in Greater Manchester we can discuss it till we're blue in our face, we're not going to change what happens over there whereas if we just talk about things that are going on in Manchester then we can make peace in Manchester and Muslims and Jews can come together here it, there's no point in discussing something that's 3,000 miles away and we've got no control over and the only thing it would do is if we did discuss it, probably there'd be a few arguments and <coughs> people wouldn't come again. So it'd be totally counterproductive. But, yeah. but I think the fact that you are a group of people who are Muslim and Jewish, if you can get on and, uh, you know, in, within Manchester, within the UK, yes. there are Jewish people, Muslim people living side by side. I think that should give people hope that the Israel-Palestine yes, conflict yes. can be resolved. Mm. Yes. If Muslim and Jewish people uh, can live in peace in other parts of the world, uh, why not there? Yeah. I, I, I think that was what the thinking was at the heart of it. Uh, what was important for us to make sure that this idea, uh, this project, actually is successful. It is far more important that actually it is successful. And then actually then being dragged this issue, which we actually, on a scale of scheme of things, uh, our impact is actually very small in solving it, but our impact on providing that alternative idea that actually it is viable that the Muslim Jewish people can actually carry on as they were before, hundreds and hundreds of years, is a very positive light. Yeah, um, and I think. Uh, it's not that the Greater Manchester Muslim Jewish Forum doesn't understand this, that there is a problem. We all do. Mm. We know that there is, yeah? But we just think, how can we be more positive? How can we provide that positive yes. impact? And that's why when the issue of Gaza happened, which we realized the difficulties, uh, and, and then the debate which we went through was, well, we can't turn our eyes blind to this. This is there, yeah? Everybody's feeling mm. it. And then we came up with the idea, which I thought was probably one of the best things that we've done, that we said we will look at it. And the way we looked at it was by defining it in the sense that each person, you speak from your perspective, how you feeling about this. And I thought uh, it was such a powerful emotional event uh, that we were first time, instead of really trying to get that whole thing dragged here, each one was expressing as an individual, how they're feeling, what impact it's having on them. And we were able to actually understand it in the alternative perspectives far better than if we just had been debating it, you know, the other way around, mm. because you sort of get into the trench uh, and you think this is it. I mean, because I'm a politician and I'm elected, sometimes I get into this hot water myself because uh, away from the forum, I do have my different views. And when I express some of those views, 
people saying, hold on, hey, why are you expressing this? Yeah. But because I'm wearing different hats, you know, uh, that's what it is. Uh, so I, I, I think it's difficult, but it's not something that uh, um, we can't uh, solve it in the sense of collective, widely, you know, we owe it actually to solve it. Uh, and setting this example, uh, it goes towards helping to that answer. And like you say, increasing a bit of positivity, yeah, spreading yeah, that positivity. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully, you know, I, I hope our listeners take away from this d discussion today that whether you voted Brexit, whether you voted to remain or to leave, yeah. end of the day, we have so much more in common than our differences. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's to join the Muslim Jewish Forum. Well, if you want to look at the website, it's www.muslimjewish.org.uk. And you'll see all the events that we've put on over 11 years. And uh, there'll, there'll be another little bar at the top where it says, you know, if you want to join us, you press and click that. And we're always more than happy to have new people coming along. Maybe you could do a program from our, one of the events. Oh, we'd like to do yes. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a really great idea yeah. because mm -hmm. we are all about at Wild Community Radio. That's mm -hmm. right. Uh, promoting positive things that go on in the community. Yeah. Yes. So so you this know this could be one of the sort of the, the referendum has happened yes. the result is the result it is and we, we know that there are 52 percent who are happy and 48 percent who aren't mm. and end of the day and we many know we of all the 52 are changing their mind and yes there's a, new, there's a new word in the dictionary now regrexit have you heard of yeah, that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. there's a new word called regrexit regrexit that's no, if you have regret yes. about brexit yeah. yeah yeah you voted but now you're good there are many actually yeah. and that's another consequence of the um, referendum new words to add to your dictionary <laughs> definitely <laughs> And there was Lexit as well, which I didn't know what that was. It was actually Labour people that wanted to oh. leave were called Lexits. Ah, Lexits. Yes. Interesting. It, your fellow MEP, uh, Julie, had a good shout at those. <laughs> <laughs> the Lexits, uh, yeah. Well, thank you for having us. It's been yes. great. Thank, thank you. you so much for to Afsal Khan and Heather Fletcher. Thank it's you. been fantastic chatting to you both. Really interesting hearing about your opinions, about what's happened with the referendum, mm. your views on what's happening with the hate crime, the interfaith issues. And, and it's so pleasing to see and hear about the amazing things you are doing to make things better for the local communities. Thank you. Thank and you. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to chat to you. And I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Awaz Community Radio. Your host was Syrah. If you'd like to get in touch with us, give us a call on 0161 839 9817. We're on Facebook. Just type in Awaz Community Radio or tweet us at Awaz Radio 122. Thank you for listening. And don't forget, we have more in common than our differences. Take care for now.